All right, well, so with Carrie's large scale or the high scale look at everything with the Rogue Basin uh, cohesive strategy, one of the things that we used that for was to go through and start taking a look at project scale. So when we're starting to get into NEPA. So what Carrie's work has done is been able to go through and isolate and, and look at areas that we would go through and treat. So looking at the Rogue Basin strategy, one of the things that we looked at was looking at landscape scale objectives uh, through that strategy. And what that did was look at, again, with uh, what Carrie had talked about, protect the local communities. We want to reduce our large wildfire for uh, damage to local communities. Restore open forest, which was a really important piece that we were taking a look at. And then also uh, promote complex habitat for northern spotted owl. Uh, and then promote landscape resilient uh, landscapes. So this was our proposed action for the Upper Briggs uh, EA and looking at it, all of the things that you'll see are common themes that were highlighted under the Rogue Basin Cohesive Strategy. Um, so when we talk about develop and enhance late seral habitat, that was one of the things that was seen there in the Rogue Basin uh, Strategy there as a need. Uh, so working with the Fish and Wildlife Service and identifying some of these areas uh, to go through and focus our, t our habitat um, enhancement. Many of the areas in this uh, project area, 70%, uh, over 70% were either managed stands or fire scars uh, across the landscape. And so again, looking at that mid uh we had a uh, large amount of that in the landscape. Pine oak habitats are, uh, were identified. And then of course, we've got sensitive plant habitats, metal restoration repairing reserves, a roadside and ridgeline field management zones, and that's gonna go into talk a little bit about how we were looking at disturbance and looking at fire uh, playing a role in the landscape, and then decrease road impacts. So I wanted to kind of get into this because this is really cool, uh, because this is a 1940 uh, aerial photo that we had of the area. We did an ortho photo uh, mosaic uh, with the old 40 photos and threw this together and put our, slapped our proposed actions into this area to take a look at it. And what I really wanted to kind of talk about a little bit here is take a look at the difference between the 40s, where we see a disturbance factor happening in the landscape, to our current. And you can still see some of those areas that have some of these areas of management. Uh, there's still some areas in here that have a little bit of more of an ultramafic influence into some of these locations. Uh, but really, the, probably the big parts are these fire scars that were located throughout the landscape. And so fire was a big, major player in this landscape. Um, one of the things that uh, we've looked at with the, the project was the influence of anthropogenic uh, burning that was in here. Uh, so this valley uh, had uh, a large elk herd uh, that many of the tribes were uh, you know, you looked at for um, food source and also not only that, but also the berry productions and other pieces that were located through this area. This area had a larger component of black oak and California, uh, California black oak and Oregon white oak that was out there. And so, you know, looking at that, not only that, but also on the ridge tops, we had a large amount of lightning strikes. So lightning strikes in these areas, this is the second ridge off of the coastal range. So we got a lot of orthographic lifting and a lot of activity that happened in these ridges to where we would see a lot of these lightning strikes. In fact, I don't have the map, but uh, this area had a tremendous amount of point data uh, from some of the fires uh, that have happened over the course of the last 40 years that's been mapped out there. Uh, this is also adjacent to the County Alpsis wilderness. Uh, so uh, that area has burned quite frequently. We've had the Biscuit fire from 2002. Uh, we just had the Checo Bar fire out of that. Uh, in 2017, uh, so definitely this, this area definitely sees a lot of fire. Uh, speaking of fire, uh, the fire history here it comes from uh, Metlin and Skinner, uh, and this was looking at uh, the dinner chronology, so the reports of fire scars uh, in some of these areas. In the Briggs area, we did have a plot that was located in there where uh, we looked at, um, you know, kind of the frequency. So we were at the five to seven year frequency in the Briggs area, according to the records. So again, back into what Paul was talking about this morning, you know, looking at areas where this area here would be in low. So it'd be in the low uh, fire um, severity in here, but a lot of frequent fires. 
But the key thing on this is notice that here's our last fire report in this area. And you see the frequency back here. And so this in here was around the formation of the National Forest System and when they started putting out all the fire guard stations. And you'll see that after that, we don't have very much uh, data out there. So it's kind of a, it's a really cool piece in this. And this has really got into the objectives of the Briggs area. So with Northern Spotted Owl, one of the key things that we were looking at was a recovery plan. And one of the things that we looked at, and we had quite a few Alcors that were located in this area. So all these stars here are Northern Spotted Owl locations. <coughs> And so there's a reason why you see this project in this kind of more like a rimmed uh, area for a proposed action was one is that we were looking at how do we go through and protect some of these high quality habitats. So there's quite a bit of RA32 that was located out here along with uh, you know, several riparians that are associated in here. So we had a lot of red tree voles that were located in this area also. So one of the things that we looked at, and Bonnie Allison uh, was our wildlife biologist. Uh, we put together a high priority site uh, strategy for this project area. Unfortunately, I don't have the mapping of this, but one of the things that we looked at was we looked at our riparians and we looked at those as management units essentially for uh, some of the species that are out there for uh, flying squirrels, red tree voles, and then also connecting those up to the RE32. And so any of these alcors that you see here are part of a system and a network that then connects up with a uh, corridor that then runs over into the next ridge system. So we used, utilize the, uh, all the riparians out there as kind of that uh, look out there. So, and then here for Upper Briggs, kind of going in from, you know, what we were looking at. So we did our analysis and we came up with our proposed treatments. And one of the things we looked at was kind of a bit of a social piece of this. And that was, you know, the roadside FMZs. You know, how do we go through and manage fire in areas where we routinely go to suppress fire? And so in these areas where, again, with the Taylor and Klondike fire, uh, we've had multiple entries into these areas where we have put line out there, we've done bear rehab, and we've said, okay, we're continually using these same areas. Why don't we manage these for FMZs? And that's exactly what we did with this project, was look at where we can locate some of these FMZs to be able to go through and use them for, frequent, or for future fire. Um, return interval uh, between Biscuit and Checo is exactly 15 years. And so we're thinking that in another 15 years, we'll have another major fire event out here. So looking at these FMZs, this would be the logical area to go through and manage. So with this, uh, we get into the implementation side. So when we start talking about our collaborations and we think about how do we go through and get all this work done where we have a tremendous amount of acres, but not enough funding. We know we don't have enough product value out there to cover all the treatments. And so this is where uh, Kerry was talking a little bit about the OWEB proposal uh, for RFRI, which is the Rogue Forest uh, Restoration Initiative, or yeah, I think I got that right. Um, and so we looked at this as a way to go through and get some of these fuels treatments completed in these locations. This is all Canyon Live Oak in here, where we have a lot of uh, thinning and treatment that we'll have to go through and, and do in here. Plus, we've got some restoration in our sugar pine locations, along with some ponderosa pine uh, treatment and Douglas fir treatment in these late open serial stands. So these are truly late open that had uh, about 120 years of growth in these areas, so. Um, the big thing is, is that uh, with that, um, you know, we do have uh, $6 million that we receive from the OWEB funding, and a portion of that will go into this area to go through and help offset some of those costs out here. So using our partners to be able to go through and generate funding to be able to help us be able to get some of our treatments and our objectives met is one of the kind of the big things that we look at with the Rogue Basin Collaborative and all the partners that are in that uh, collaborative, which includes state, um, it includes all of our BLM counterparts, and also includes uh, TNC, Clanford Observatory, and a few others that have been really instrumental at being able to 
to help kind of highlight this area for treatment. This area also happens to be just on the most prominent ridge right adjacent to a wildland urban interface, uh, which is Shan Creek. And that's a local community there that just missed the fire uh, from last year. So, or yeah, 2018. So, and that's it. Any questions? So the question was, are there areas that have been identified that isn't consistent with the Northwest Forest Plan? And what do we do about it? So um, our work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, coupled along with uh, our work with our collaborators, has been able to go through and identify, again, the high priority site piece was one of the key pieces to this project area, um, which allowed us to be able to be able to go through and highlight the need for open late sero. And so uh, with that, um, you know, it was, we were able to go through and make the case for treatment in those areas to be able to meet those objectives and to apply fire out there. Because that's the thing is that we run into LSR uh, areas and we talk about this kind of late closed in a lot of respects, but we don't talk about late open as much. And I think that's the key piece is being able to identify, and that's what this, uh, this collaborative did was to go through and help describe that. How can we go through and uh, be able to get more laid open out there, which then conversely ends up happening or helping us with regards to our FMZ management. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Tell me, thank these guys, everybody.